Hi everybody, it's John Pushkar, coming to you today with another episode about how to stay safe and stay alive in the fuels and combustion equipment safety world. Today I want to talk to you about the world of pressure bolted boundary connections. Typically you might think about these as being flanged connections. So today we're going to talk about things like, for example, these two bolts. So what about the markings on the head of these two bolts? Do they make a difference? What about markings on this nut? Does that make a difference? Do I use washers in this assembly? What about the gaskets? Any special kind of gaskets I need to use? Anything I should stay away from when I'm preparing this joint? What about the types of flanges? What about when I tighten this connection? Do I just tighten the living hell out of it? Or do I need to use a torque wrench? and a specific bolting pattern when I tighten all of these fasteners. I'm going to tell you about these things and more. And as you might have come to expect from my episodes, when there's something in the topic that has caused the loss of life, I try to reference it. Hopefully it means more to you that way and it draws your attention. That's certainly my intent. Today's episode is no exception. In October of 1990, the USS Iwo Jima, while supporting an operation in Desert Storm, experienced a horrible, tragic steam explosion in the boiler room that took the lives of 10 sailors. How did it happen? Why did it happen? It happened because preventatively, they tried to rebuild some valves while in port. The valves were reassembled with the wrong kinds of fasteners. They were actually black plated brass fasteners instead of steel fasteners. These fasteners failed. The bonnets on the valves came apart. 10 sailors couldn't escape the boiler room and they tragically perished. Want to learn how to avoid these kinds of situations at your operations? Please keep watching. Over the last 40 years, I've developed and led fuels and combustion equipment safety programs for the largest manufacturers in the world. Today, I'm bringing you knowledge, insights, and best practices about fired equipment and natural gas safety. Over the next few minutes, you'll get the kind of practical, real-life explanations that I've become known for. Doing a bolted flange connection is trickier than it looks. It makes me crazy that people need special certifications and years of experience, and they need to demonstrate competence to do welding. But we hand people wrenches who have little or no training and tell them to go ahead, assemble that flange connection and just tighten the bolts. Once you learn more about what's really going on to make a bolted connection work, I think you'll see that this makes no sense at all. You see, when we talk about a bolted flange connection, we're really talking about a system. And the system's got three components. There's the flange itself. You have to have the right type of flange, raised face or flat faced. Typically, it's raised face in higher pressure applications. You need to have the right gasket, which depends on things like the temperatures and pressures involved, the types of grooves that might be in the flange. Oh yes, there are grooves in flanges, and it's this embedding of that gasket material in those grooves that actually makes the thing seal at all. And how does it get embedded? It gets embedded because you've used the right fasteners and provided the right clamping force to make the whole system work properly. Want to know more? I want to show you a little clip here from my module 15 from the Prussian Technical Services online school. It's all about pressure bolted boundary connections. There's life-saving information here and the life that you save might just be yours. We're gonna close this module with taking a look at the importance of assembly techniques. So here I'm showing you some bolted pressure connections, a flange connection and a steam valve bonnet connection that have failed. So how do we make better, more reliable bolted pressure connections? Well, now you certainly understand that it's the right fasteners, the right flanges, the right gaskets. It's making sure that the flanges are 
in a good condition to be reassembled if you're reassembling a joint. Now we need to tell you about the little bit of magic that makes this all come together most successfully. And that has to do with the procedure for how we actually apply torque to the bolts. But now we have to discuss one more detail because at this point we understand the components required, but we don't necessarily understand some of what needs to go into assembling this joint successfully. Assembling these joints successfully means we have to apply the proper torque and do that in the proper sequence. If you haven't done so already, it's important that you identify all the most critical bolted pressure connections in your facility. And as a matter of reducing risk and enhancing safety, I suggest you do a little focus project on them and establish for them procedures like we're going to talk about in this last section of this module. Also, take a look at the fasteners that are used now, the gaskets that are used now, and take a look at the folks who are applying these joints, maybe during turnarounds or when there's service work. Make sure they're trained and understand some of the most important basic elements of this module. Before we get into successful assembly techniques, let's review again some of the things that make for non-uniform clamping that contribute to the failure and leaking of bolted connections. Right above my picture to the left, I'm showing you how there are certain forces at work that can blow gaskets out, that can dislodge some small amount of contact area that may be remaining due to poor clamping force and make for a leak like I'm showing you below my picture. You could see this gasket that's in the middle of the slide and you see where the blue arrow is pointing? That's showing you clamping force that exists. You can see where it's robust and red. There's a lot that would have to break through, but you could see that there could be somewhat weak areas where the blue arrow is and at the bottom where it's possible there isn't much that's left between success and failure anymore for a number of reasons that you now know about. There could be flange misalignment, differences in flange face conditions. Maybe this has been reused. Maybe one part of it's been cleaned well, another part hasn't. Maybe we don't have the proper clamping force because someone's lubricated some of the fasteners. Maybe there's different torque on some of the fasteners. So again, there could be many reasons. And I want to remind you, although it's very tempting to do so, don't tighten bolts on pressurized systems. You must depressurize before you go ahead and try to retighten a fastener. There have been many fasteners that have failed or gasket conditions have taken that final little turn for the worse and injured many people who have tried to work on pressurized systems. I'm going to be providing for you as well a couple of papers about tragedies that have occurred when people have done this, just to reinforce this message. So I want you to understand as well that clamping force can change over time. Loose bolts are a symptom of a problem. It's likely they didn't start off loose, but because of corrosion, thermal cycling, vibration, deformation of a flange, misalignment, shear loads, inconsistent tightening patterns, or even clamp load relaxation because of a phenomenon called creep. Creep occurs when we apply forces below yield strength over long periods of time, and especially where elevated temperatures are involved. This can occur with gasket materials as well and make them shift around or deform more than we expected, which would again result in less clamping force. We've mentioned torque a number of times. That would be the force that's applied to the fastener that's creating the tension effect. Torque is commonly measured with torque wrenches. There's dial indicating type, there's click type, there are electronic digital readout types. It's important that you understand torque recommendations. Here I'm showing you a table, and there are tables like this. You can get these from fastener manufacturers. It's recommended torque for B7 bolts, A193, based on 70% yield strength. And it's showing you a nut size, and then it's also showing you different kinds of lubes, and also showing you what occurs when it's dry. 
you can see the dramatic impact, just like I indicated in the little video clip that I provided for you, that occurs when a fastener is lubricated. You'll also need to be consulting the gasket manufacturer on the type of flange that you're applying, the type of bolts being used, and the type of gasket that's selected, again, to better understand what torque's gonna be required from each fastener to get the design clamping force that the gasket manufacturer requires. Then comes the issue of possible torque patterns, especially with somewhat complex bolted connections like the many bolts shown here in what could possibly be a manway cover. There are somewhat complex, elaborate torque sequences which folks have studied which give you the best chances for success. There are tables of these provided in PCC1. Now that you understand all of the complexities, I hope that you agree that for at least your most critical applications, you need to have a documented procedure that includes a torque sequence. This procedure might identify the specific system or even the flanges or the bolted connection, whatever it is, maybe it's a manway cover that you intend to address. You need to call out issues like the gasket material, the cleanliness of the surfaces that are involved and what might be expected. Might even have pictures of these things. You might call off any sealant or lubricant that's applied to gasket surfaces. You might identify the proper grade marking of bolts and nuts and whether they're to be dry or lubricated, whether or not there are washers involved and the specific types. Then of course you've got the torque which will be in a sequence like I'm showing you here and then you'll have a pattern. Here it says for example tighten all nuts initially by hand torque each nut to 30%, then to 60%, then to the full required torque. And it talks here about using a cross bolt tightening pattern, but now you know that you should refer to PCC1, depending on what kind of flange you're tightening, to make sure that you're using an appropriate tightening pattern and sequence. This also talks about a recheck after some amount of time. You can understand you may have a relaxation of the gasket material at that point, and you may do well, especially once things have been in service, to depressurize and again check that joint. Here's an example of a bolt tightening sequence and some bolt tightening procedures. There are many of these available over the internet from various sources. I recommend that you investigate these, try to find something that's appropriate for you speak to gasket manufacturers, speak to bolt suppliers, get PCC1, get ASME B16.5, and create a new paradigm, create a new culture for your facility where there are people paying attention to bolted flanged connections and raise your game in that area. Hopefully, I've been successful in convincing you that these are critical areas for risk reduction and safety management that you should be paying attention to. Neither Prescient Technical Services, Inc. or John R. Pushkar, the presenter and author of this work, warrant or represent expressly or by implication the correctness or accuracy of the content of the information presented. The user or viewer of this work accepts any legal liability or responsibility whatsoever for the consequences of its use and misuse. Hopefully you found something here of value that you can pass on to friends or co-workers. If you can, please hit the like button and share this video. And I'd also like to invite you to the Prescient Technical Services Online School, where you'll find more than 20 modules that I've created from knowledge I've acquired over the past 40 years, traveling over 3 million miles and being in and out of more than 300 industrial plants in 12 different countries. So once again, thank you very much for being here. It's my mission to pass on important life-saving information. I'll be releasing one of these videos just about every week. And if you could subscribe, 
and the link below, I'll make sure that you get first notice of every time a new video comes out. Once again, thank you and please have a safe day.